Brothers and sisters, happy Sunday. Kinfolk, let us pray. Eternal Creator, I pray that the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts and minds will be pleasing and acceptable unto Thee, our guide and our destination. Amen. Well, get behind me, Satan. Those are strong words for Christ's own best beloved, Peter. Uh, We talked recently about the role that Satan plays in the Bible and how people get it sideways. People imagine the devil, this little guy running around with a pitchfork, showing up on one of your shoulders, telling you to do bad stuff. That's That's not the Satan of the Bible. The Satan of Scripture is a prosecutor sent by God in order to suss out a person's true motives. Jesus hears temptation then perhaps in Peter's words. We don't have Peter's direct quotes uh, from the Gospel of Mark. It is in other Gospels, but we know what Peter's responding to. Jesus says, uh, you guys have read your Bibles, right? You know know what has to happen. (laughs) The Son of Man has to undergo suffering, be rejected, be killed. Peter says, uh, no, that's a terrible idea. That doesn't make any kind of sense at all. See, Peter knows what they ought to do. Peter's a businessman, right? He was a fisherman. He owned his own charter boat company on the Sea of Galilee for many years. Probably met with success. It doesn't really indicate whether or not Peter was a successful fisherman before he took up his mantle of discipleship. But I can imagine Peter saying that that's, that's nonsense. You can't go into town expecting them to just reject you and kill you. I think Peter might have a different vision for ministry a successful ministry. Jesus is doing well. He's got the multitudes, it says. He's got people following him. Why are you going to throw all of that away? For what? To get killed? And Jesus says, you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. When I was going through seminary a billion years ago, they had, they had us read a lot of books from the Harvard School of Business. Harvard School of Business is still printing books. You can go, you can go buy them for yourself. You can make a little bit of money uh, for the people that print the books, I suppose. They wanted us to have good business acumen for running the churches. I never really understood that. I went to a lot of seminars. Most of them were focused on market research and capitalization, demographics. We have a a culture of business in America. It's done some good things, I suppose. It doesn't have a whole lot to say to the church, but that doesn't mean it doesn't speak to the, the church. Our culture defines just about everything that we do. And we're in a pretty awful spot as the church. We get to respond to culture. We get to reply or react to culture. Hasn't been that way for most of the history of the church. But it is that way now and perhaps it's fine, perhaps it's good, I'm not sure. Peter has a culture. Peter knows what's best. Peter wants Jesus to be successful in his ministry. When I hear Jesus rebuking Peter, I hear him saying, get behind me. I'm not your mascot. I'm your savior. I think that we want mascots. 
We look for people in the world who exemplify the traits that we think are best and we lift them up and we celebrate them. A recent survey of fifth graders, uh, elementary school out west, asked them what they wanted to be when they grew up. And of course, many of them wanted to be astronauts. Many of them wanted to be basketball players and sports stars. And uh, Lord knows, we do need more of those, you know? Especially astronauts. Not a one of them, said uh, Congregationalist Minister. I might not be representing well enough, but something caught my eye because 15% of these fifth graders said they wanted to be influencers. That's 15%. That's a lot. That's more than said they wanted to be teachers. An influencer is a person who's famous on the internet and they make videos about themselves. We're always on the lookout for influencers. I wonder if Peter saw Jesus that way. Peter said to Jesus, you got these multitudes following you. You're going to go into Jerusalem and say some gobbledygook about what you read in the Bible, and they're going to hate you for it. They're going to kill you. And Jesus says, yeah, I know. That's the plan. <laughs> Jesus says, that's, that's what I came here to do. And Peter says, that's nonsense. That makes no business sense at all. Uh, and Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. We want a mascot. We want to find somebody who will just reaffirm our best cultural values and then tell us that what we think is right is actually right. And one of the reasons that this is so nefarious is because the church today is downstream of culture. Um, you know, they say politics is downstream of culture. That means that culture creates something and then it flows downstream and then the politicians pick it up and make hay out of it. Culture. Politics is downstream of culture. You know who said that? Very smart thing. Steve Bannon. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Politics is downstream of culture. And culture is always creating something new for us to get angry about. Is the gospel always in tension with our culture? <sighs> culture is all over the map. We, we don't escape it in the church. We don't, I, don't, I found this on my preaching desk over there. I don't know who put it there. Probably a small child. 90% of the things that are on my preaching desk were placed there by a child under the age of 10. Some of you know what this is and some of you don't. This is a communion cup. Some of you under a certain age are saying, that is the tiniest communion cup I have ever seen. How in the world are 50 people supposed to dip their crackers in this communion cup. But lo, lo, many years ago, this is how we used to take communion. You see, we would take these little cups and we put them in a tray, the hundred of them, and some poor sap who drew the short straw would have to fill each of those cups with a little tiny syringe that would fill them each with juice. And then we would pass these trays of cups, of like this, little shot glasses, from person to person in the pews and take it. And then we would take a little piece of Wonder Bread and we would do it together, you know, uh, um, one, two, three, chin, chin, uh, in the pews. You wouldn't have to come forward and do any of this stuff. We started doing intinction about 10, uh, 15, 20 years ago. And people lost their minds in the church. They said, give us back our cups. We demand our little cups. See, these are the cups of the Bible. When Jesus instituted the Last Supper, the, the Lord's Supper, he gave each of them a little tiny cup. He said, you're going to fill this up with grape juice. And they said, Lord, what is grape juice? And he said, it's unfermented wine. It hasn't been invented yet. The Methodists will create it in 1890 in order to appease the members of their temperance society. And he said, as often as you do this little cup, do it. No, we created these cups in the 1920s, 1910s and 20s, to evade the tuberculosis epidemic. These cups were instituted in the 1910s and 1920s in order to avoid the spread of, of TB uh, in our churches. And the people lost their minds, especially the Methodists, because they look like shot glasses. 
And that's what we started with, because that's all we had. Then we changed them to look like this. Culture, culture, culture said, I won't drink my communion wine out of a shot glass. And the Methodist said, well, you don't have to drink wine. You can drink grape juice. We've invented it. Richard Welch, he created Welch's grape juice. Anyway, my point is that culture seems to occupy the mind of Christians and take over the churches. When we went back to dipping, culture is everywhere. Culture invents something new for us to get angry about every five minutes. I don't pay attention anymore. I don't know what they're angry about anymore. I know they were angry about green M&Ms. And then it was Mr. Potato Head. Something happened to Mr. Potato Head, and they were angry about that. Lately, some people are really angry about some stuff that happened at the Super Bowl. My God, I can't follow that stuff to save my life. It was the 49ers and the Chiefs. I saw that. I just said, I hope they both lose. And that was, I stopped paying attention to it. But there was a singer and a boyfriend and a whole bunch of stuff. And somehow they said it has to do with the election. Now we're supposed to be angry about the election. This is an election year. Sometimes their anger in the culture gets so wild that it costs people their lives. A kid was assaulted at a high school, beaten to death because of some gender thing, some, tra- trans, some transgender issue or something. It's, it's, in, it's, it's in the culture. The culture is inf- inf- infuriated by this, um, by, by people uh, being assigned one gender at birth and then changing their gender later on as they get older uh, and, and living as the person that they want to live as. And, the, and people are angry and they're, they're, they're passing laws about it to, to, to make it illegal to do this or something. I don't know. It's, it's nonsense. It's a thing that's been made up. It's, it's, and then people say, well, this is a new thing. This, is, well, this has never happened before. It's nonsense. It's nonsense. People have been changing their gender for as long as gender's been a concept. This is a, I've been trying to figure this stuff out. This is a a newspaper article uh, from the New York Daily News, uh, Monday, December 1st, 1952, 1952. This is a back page article. It says, XGI becomes blonde beauty. Uh, Bronx youth is a happy woman after two years and six operations. A Bronx youth who served two years in the army during the war, honorably discharged, has been transformed into a happy, beautiful young woman. This is a this is story of, uh, of uh, the former George Jorgensen Jr. has been officially changed. It says a son of a Bronx carpenter whose name and uh, all past army records uh, have been officially changed to Christine Jorgensen. And this new woman has made a successful career for herself as a color photographer and hopes to someday go to Hollywood. This is, this is a story from 1952. Now, I checked the congressional record because I thought, my God, people must have lost their minds, right? It's no, nothing. But culture tells us there's a new thing that's happening. We are going to pay attention and get angry about it. Ooh. The Savior says, the Savior says that it, you, you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Culture is going to find something, some little object, some something. They're going to get on the news and culture is going to say, this is a new threat. This is a brand new thing that those the liberals just invented to, you know, change things or whatever. We've never encountered this before. And the, and the Bible says uh, it's bad. The Bible says we're against it. And you say, well, where? And they're like, yeah, it's in there. I read it. Just trust me. Because you're not going to, this thing's 2,000 pages long. They know you're not going to go through and read it. You're just going to have to take their word for it. Culture is going to invent a new thing. And the church has always got two options. The church is going to be able to say, okay, well, we better deal with this. We better respond. Jesus says, those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, then the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in glory. What does it mean, adulterous? Why does he say adulterous? 
What is adulterous about that generation when we think about Peter's words? Sometimes I think that our culture competes for our affection with God. Our culture is like somebody who we meet at work, at the workplace. And uh, if you're a hard worker, maybe you were at your office 40, 50, 60 hours a week. And there's somebody at that workplace that knows you're married. They know you're married, but they've got their eyes set on you. And they know that you maybe spend 15 hours a week with your spouse at home. But they get you for the whole work week. God help you. Maybe your desks are right next to each other. You don't seem to spend as much time with your spouse as you do with this coworker. This adulterous generation where the church gets you for an hour on Sunday morning and the culture gets you all the rest of the week. What do you do? A lot of us wear a wedding band, right? Is an indication that we've made a promise to be faithful to one person. Doesn't matter if we're sitting next to that coworker for five hours a week or 50 hours a week. We have that reminder of where our first faith lies. For Christians, it is hard. It is hard to carry with you your faith in God, your love of God, your love and, and affection and, and covenant relationship with the gospel of Jesus Christ into a world that is competing to encourage you to commit adultery against the gospels. The gospel asks a high price of us because it asks us to take culture and all of the trappings that come with it and make it serve the gospel, make it subservient to the Bible and subservient to our faith. Not to take culture and our beliefs and put them above our faith and say, well, what, what can the Bible say that's going to reinforce my cultural beliefs or my political beliefs? But to take our cultural beliefs and our political belief, beliefs and make them subservient to our first marriage to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the hard thing. That's the hard thing. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. If you want to become my disciples, he teaches, deny yourself and take up the cross and follow me. Me. So I don't know what culture is going to have for us next week, or tomorrow. Uh, it's going to be influencers. Uh, there's going to be stuff on the news that we're supposed to get mad about. Uh, there's going to be a lot of it because it's an election year. It's crazy. It's crazy in election years. But I do know that this doesn't change. I know that this isn't going to invent new things for us to get angry about. And if you like to be angry about things, there's plenty of stuff in here to get angry about. Just to remind you the plight of the poor and the oppressed and the marginalized, care for creation, forgiveness and mercy, loving your enemies, treating people with sacrificial kindness and love. There's plenty of things in here to keep yourself occupied out there in the world. Culture will continue to invent new things for us to get angry about. It is on us to live into our gospel fidelity, our first faith, our first faith and our first promise and covenant before we give in to culture and what it tells us is best or productive or profitable. Beloved, in this season of Lent, don't be afraid 
to make your first fidelity to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you feel that you are being tempted into adultery by culture or the world, do what I do. Just crack open the, the gospel. Read it. There's Bibles everywhere. Didn't used to be. There's Bibles everywhere. As though you would, in a moment of weakness, review your wedding vows, reread the Gospels, and commit yourself for the sake of the Gospel to the way of Jesus Christ first and in all things. And I promise you, I promise you, you will meet with a life for the ages, a good life, a profitable life, but what can you give in return for that life? <sighs> Nothing. Fidelity for the sake of the gospels, brothers and sisters. And together to the victory of Easter. Amen.